Here we are at Ubu Dub Podcast number four, where we're speaking to Gagarin, a.k.a. Graham Dowdle, a.k.a. Dids, as we call him in the band, who joined Perubu in 2007, I think, Dids, but you played with the Pale Boys before, or was it after that? Quite a long time ago, I shared a manager with Perubu and David, a guy called Nick Hobbs. Nick Hobbs helped David to put together the Pale Boys incarnation with Andy Diagram and Keith. Andy Diagram couldn't do a Pale Boys gig. I met David. David checked that I was pale enough. And David and I kind of pretty much hit it off, really. And at some point, I got another call from David to say, oh, are you interested in doing live sound for Pale Boys? I said, David, I've never done live sound in my life. He said, oh, no, well, but you make records, you make a good sound, it'll be fine. First gig I ever did live sound for in my life for anything was in the Queen Elizabeth Hall to do Disaster Drome, which was terrifying, but it went okay. On very odd occasions, we'd play as a trio or Andy couldn't do something and I'd be asked to play and or do the sound at the same time. Somewhere along the line, David asked me to do Perubu live sound. Then got a call from David to say, uh, Dids, uh, I've decided to sack you as the sound man. And I thought, OK, OK, big pause, because I'd like you to join the band. That's how I came to be in Perubu. And you've played with Nico, John Cale, some amazing people. I presume Perubu were, were on your radar, the same sort of genre? Yeah, fellow travellers, I suppose, for 40-odd years now, yeah. And did David Thomas's reputation precede him? Did you enter the fray with some trepidation? No trepidation. His reputation preceded him, but I'd worked with John Cale and Nico. Um, so, you know, the idiosyncrasies of creative characters was something I was very familiar with and pretty comfortable with. I was listening to an interview that David took yesterday, which uh, he was asked about the calibre of musicians that Perubu has attracted over the years. And it was very interesting that he said, you know, these musicians aren't joining for the, the fame or the money or the girls. There's, there's some kind of calling to Perubu. Um, do you agree coming from the other end of that question? David once accused me when we were on tour, he said, hey, did, sir. the only reason you became a musician was to get girls. And there may be some truth in that. I'd like to think not, but that's his perspective. No, absolutely. Well, you should read the books. Um, I suppose, yeah, the, I've never, ever been interested in doing safe easy music and working with safe easy musicians i've done a couple of easy sort of session jobs i hated it um i like challenge i like difficulty um you know i'm a trained lawyer i didn't become a musician for for for, for the money because i could be a rich retired lawyer at this point it is despite what david said it's the art it's the it's the pushing yourself, it's the endless effort to be creative and do new stuff. So fitting into the Perubu ideology, if there is such a thing, um, was something I was very comfortable with. Are you content with your lot? Are you content with your lot? Woman, I am content. A captain of dragoons, King Vincent's Lass's right-hand man. Decorated with the border of the Red Eagle of Poland. Retired King Farragut. I'm the cap of so much less. You deserve the crown of Poland. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. Have a ball. As we've heard on David and Robert's podcast, they both spoke about that that freedom when you approach a new album and the uniqueness of every live performance. I mean, I'm presuming you feel that too, right? You deserve the crown of Poland. Kill them all. Kill them all. Well, I, for me, that's the point. That's the point of being a musician. I'd hate to be in a band where every song sounded the same every night. It's blooming boring, you know, machines were created to do that sort of thing. And whilst 
you know, most of the time we're not doing pure improvisation. Sometimes we are. We did a fantastic um, Visions of the Moon tour where we effectively improvised utterly although and wrote the new album so there's usually this combination of the song and that moment's reinterpretation of the song and that for me is is really the exciting thing of what it's all about you could have a big sombrero what of it so I asked David what I should ask you and what he'd like to hear the answer to. And he said, ask Dids about the, the curveball situation when we're live on stage. I love the curveball. I love the feeling put on the spot. You know, like David, I've performed thousands of gigs. And what the curveball gives you is that immediacy, the chance to feel a bit nervous, the chance to feel a little bit scared and therefore a bit excited. So as well as the curveball, you have those potentially death knell moments where David just stops the entire performance. I mean, I remember when I did my one and only ever performance with Perubu as Merubu in the operetta Bring Me the Head of uh, Ubu Roy. And David just stopped the entire show as I was trying to die in my interpretation of the entire Polish army. And it's pretty frightening, isn't it? That moment where everything stops. How do you deal with that? It's about performance. It's about theatre. It's about the moment and and confounding people's expectations. When we did the big stage version of LLPU at the Queen Elizabeth Hall or Royal Festival Hall, I had to act. I'm not a natural actor. I had to act a sort of preppy kind of upper middle class guy wearing chinos and you know, anyone who knows me knows that's not exactly me. And I came on and I started to talk and David stopped the whole show because I'd made a South London glottal stop and he made me repeat the same line about five times until I sounded slightly more middle class. So that, that was quite a moment in front of 900 people trying to sort of drop my... Um, 50 odd years at that time of, of inherited language skills and, and speak in a completely different way. Well, you get no sympathy from me because I was in sackcloth with a pair of huge fake rubber tits on. No, I don't expect sympathy. I, I, you know, David, I'm sure, wouldn't like me to say that it's kind of Brechtian, you know, and I've always been interested in that step in, step outside the performance zone. And first time David stops a song and says it's no, that's wrong, we've got to start again. It's kind of scary, it's kind of intimidating, it's potentially embarrassing in front of an audience. But he does it with a style and panache that makes it acceptable, that makes it a part of the performance, and the audience get it. The audience aren't, oh dear, this band have messed up, they're having to start again. It's like, yeah, the band have messed up, but that's okay, because the master is pulling them back into line, yeah. <laughs> One of those show-stopping moments, uh, a little bit of insight for the listeners to the podcast here, actually happened four times on uh, that Montreux gig that's available in the CD pack um, on Who Stole the Signpost four times and the musicians kept starting it and David kept stopping it. No, no, it's got to be right. Um, it's uh, How was that gig for you, that, that gig in Montreux? The process leading up to that and the two days of that, of playing in Ramsgate and then Montreuil, were, was amongst the most intense, emotionally affecting, demanding few days of my 
of my life really, certainly of my performing career. We were originally, Keith and I, charged with preparing two or three songs from the new album to play at the gigs, which we're going to do alongside some nice safe old songs and a bit of nice easy improv. Keith and I were aware that David wasn't in the greatest of health. We were also aware that this album was incredibly personal, that this album stood up as a whole and we sat in rehearsal and within the first 10 minutes of the rehearsal of just Keith and I we sort of looked at each other and said look we've got to do the lot so we took on doing the lot David was he needed reassurance that we were confident he got that reassurance maybe we weren't quite as confident as I portrayed to David you know we knew that this was the gig we had to do and I think that as ever with David his confidence feeds your confidence we started the gig you know from the first note it was pretty clear that this is going to work and the audience were just so wonderful they knew they were in on something special they knew that they were witnessing a pretty unique event. They fed us the energy and the confidence to pull it off, really. I've been around for the conception of, I think, four albums now with Perubu, and all the musicians tend to have a favourite track on those albums. But this one's different because I have never heard the musicians completely across the board just love everything about it, every track about it. Um, how is it for you? I think lyrically, David has never been better. Actually, I think very few people have ever been better lyrically than David is on this record. The sound world of loads of synths, programmed drums, is probably one that is closer to me in some ways than it is to any of the other musicians in the band. As soon as I heard the first note, that kind of resonated. The fact that the album is so coherent and has got, got such a strong narrative running through it, in a way, the greatest thing about it, which is why Keith and I said we can't just do two or three songs, we've got to do the lot or nothing, because it is just this, this beautiful, coherent thing. So the moment I first heard the first bit of a track I thought yes I really need to get into this spend some real time thinking about how I can contribute meaningfully as we now know David did most of the synth work on the latest album himself um, before he sent it out to people so how did you feel when you got these tracks for the first time with a load of synths on them some of the sounds were very familiar to my own palette some of the approaches felt like close to my own methodology so it was like okay you know I'm already involved in this obviously I hadn't I hadn't contributed anything my role has always been quite a demanding one and and quite a nuanced and tricky one because you know Robert is the long time fantastic synth player in Perubu I've had to find a niche in the Perubu sound world which is about subtle small but highly meaningful contributions that would add something that had some meaning rather than just, oh, I can put another pretty sound on the top of this because I've got a million synths in my studio. The thing that's great about you as well is that you don't just uh, listen to them and then send one thing in. You listen to them and send one thing in and then you send another thing in and, and you're sending things over and over and over again uh, with giving David so much material to play with. Sometimes I think when I hear a track back, oh, David obviously rejected that contribution, decided not to use it. And then three months later, it's like, oh, no, he didn't. It's in there somewhere, maybe buried sonically. It may be added to with other things. So I really don't know what percentage David uses. What I do know is that David listens respects every contribution and makes a judgment in terms of what he thinks the track needs. The sound world has to serve the song and I trust David absolutely implicitly. I might disagree with him, I might think oh my part needs to be loud and dominant and over everything but I completely respect the integrity of his vision and trust that in the end he'll have 
done the right thing for Perubu. And then you have to take the contributions of those eight or nine musicians and condense them down into four for the live show. And of course, you're responsible for sorting that out of what samples you're taking from uh, everything from accordion to drums to synths, etc. What goes over to the guitar, what goes over to the drums. Um, what's that process like for you? A lot of that stuff is technical, is laborious, is pretty dull because it's not creative it's like finding a loop point it's adding it to this it's transferring this file it's it's thinking how does this fit in and you know that's the stuff that I think as a musician frankly we'd rather not have to do but the outcome is worth the effort so which one track from the live album would you say we could play now to demonstrate the complexity of that oh gosh I suppose flicking cigarettes is pretty challenging to pull off live. Um, certainly pop radio is because David doesn't really count in the way that normal musicians count. So when you listen to the piece, it sounds structurally relatively straightforward. You think, really? Well, from the outside. But when you go into it, it's like, oh, there's 17 bars there, then there's five bars there, then that loops around there for another six and a half times, and that goes there. And it's like, oh my gosh, because technology doesn't really work that way. Technology wants to do four bars, eight bars, 16 bars, loop it up, come round again. And telling a sampler that was designed for four bar music and four four music that it's going to play 17 bars and three and a half bars is just, it's a negotiation beyond belief with technology. That live version of pop radio is all the more astonishing because one of the mans that he does in Take It Like a Man, um, that one note he, he holds for, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds, which is all the more remarkable considering that three days later he was admitted to hospital as an emergency, you know? I mean, his, his vocals just seem to be at, at absolute peak right now. <laughs> David is always an incredible vocalist, but I have to say, I feel that was amongst the very, very highest vocal performances I have ever heard from David. I think his vocals would sound utterly astonishing. If you didn't know that this man was pretty unwell, you would think he was at the, he'd just come out of the gym, he was at the peak of health and fitness. The Perubu van has uh, well established notoriety for the uh, people inside having their own quirks and uh, established fam family roles. Uh, how was it for you stepping into that van as the first shock horror vegetarian? <laughs> That's fine. You know, I, I, you, you take the abuse from David, the sneeze, but David is, you know, I'm not going to sit here and just praise David, but David is amongst the most respectful human beings you could ever meet. And you declare yourself as a vegetarian, you are catered for as a vegetarian. You know, that's, that's the way it goes. And I don't think it's ever really been a problem. Well, you have a 50-50 split now between the band and the crew, so one day you'll be taking over, I'm sure. Well, you know, and one band member who, whose name will not be mentioned reneged on long-term vegetarianism um, in order to eat black pudding and other meat-based delicacies, meat and blood-based delicacies. And actually, there was more abuse and sneering to the Dark Destroyer when he 
came in from the vegetarian side to the carnivore side, he got a lot of abuse then, more, much more than I've ever had as a vegetarian stroke vegan. One thing you start to realise very quickly when you start touring with Perubu is the absolute massive importance that's laid on a meal and food and whether it's going to be a good meal or a bad meal. No, there's no disappointment like the vegetarian meal we were all served in possibly Frankfurt, which was boiled white pasta with nothing, if I remember rightly. In my time, the most divisive was the pink soup with an egg in the middle of it, which I uh, remember ended up with a mobile phone being smashed against a brick wall. The, the, the pasta was the worst because I had four days of, we ate that because of you. Um, <laughs> and it was pretty disgusting. But you're right. I mean, you know, I've spent quite a lot of the last 40 years on the road in the tour bus. And, you know, it's hell you look forward to the tiny moments of pleasure and they might be those beautiful corn and um, peanut butter sort of crispy things we used to be able to find on the motorway that David would always steal whenever I got them. I'd buy them because I love them. I'd put them and he'd see them. Those are mine. And they'd move to his side of the van. Those moments are what you really look forward to. And actually, more than anything, it's breakfast. You know, it's the quality of a breakfast that, that drives the day because the, the breakfast is what you remember for the next eight hours of out of barn hell. So during your time on the road, you're asked to occasionally pick up on back catalogue tracks and one of my favourites was from a set that you all did around four years ago which included Caroline. Um, how is that, that for you when you're walking in the footsteps of people like Robert Wheeler, Alan Ravenstein, etc.? Well, it's, it's a challenge because I don't use the same type of instruments as, as, as Alan or Robert. It depends really on if Robert is playing or not. Now, if Robert's not playing, there's that linear kind of role that Robert plays where he's putting a linear sonic line over the top of stuff and it's coming in and out as a sort of solo which needs to be replicated or needs to, to have something else to do that. So that's about thinking what can I do that takes the same role but isn't the same as what Robert or Alan would have done. So it's, it's a challenge because you don't want to be slavish because Perubu isn't slavish to its past but it needs to sound like the song did and David is very particular about particular elements of a song that he needs and those aren't always the obvious elements of the song to outsiders. They're the obvious elements to David. That's what I sing off. That's what this song sits on. But that can be a really, really subtle contribution sometimes. So it's about finding, being sure of what the essence is of what you've got to do, but that you're not there wearing a Robert or an Alan mask. The new album speaks very fondly of the roads in America and the travels in America. Does that translate to European travel and European roads? The mythology of the road is central in America. We don't have that in this country because fundamentally our roads are too short, our country's too small. You can pretty much go from the top to bottom in a day. So that idea of the long road and what that represents in terms of mythology and in terms of uh, metaphor doesn't really exist in the same way here. So I've always been drawn into the mythology of the American road from Kerouac and from all the others. And and I've spent a lot of time on the motorways of Europe, which are long at times, don't really have the same romance, but there is a romance. And, and it, sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, Kraftwerk managed to uh, mythologize the German roads in, in an incredible way, but very few people have really taken on board the road other than Americans. For me, one of the really incredible things about this album is how it, how it draws a lot of those road themes together. So I really buy into that. You know, and I don't, I think very few people have got near David in terms of, 
excuse the word, David, the poetry of the road. As we now know, when he wrote the album, he thought it was the end of the road. But thank goodness we've got a new road waiting. Where do you see that one going? I don't know. I really haven't got a clue. Isn't there a great line in in an LPU which is about something about adventures to come, I think. And, And that's kind of, I guess, how I feel about it. You know, it's been uncertain. Third or fourth time I listened to The Road Ahead, I got quite sad. I probably shed a tear because when the song reaches Bay City and the muffler's falling off, fender's battered and you've reached the sea I thought okay this is probably the end of Perubu and I found that upsetting not because creative projects come to an end more on a sort of personal level because of my closeness to David but as it's become obvious that this is just the end of one road I look forward to seeing what the next road might look like The album that I personally uh, see as taking a departure in a big leap from the back catalogue is Carnival of Souls. Um, And that seems to be where you and and Keith um, really took it into a different direction. And of course, that was picked up by people like American Horror Story. And it really took it to a different level. Um, Tell me your thoughts on Carnival of Souls. I love Carnival Souls. I feel very close to it. I mean, the way the album was kind of written was live on stage, effectively, starting with almost nothing, um, except we worked from the film soundtrack as well. So there were two elements. There was kind of what you could call improvisation or you could call spontaneous songwriting, plus the response to the incredible film and pulling those two elements together. So... I feel very, very, I have have a very strong sense of ownership um, in terms of the compositional as well as the terms of the arrangement for Carnival of Souls. Road to Utah is on the encore of the live CD in the in the pack, as is Running Dry, which personally, as somebody who's been in the audience listening to that many times, that's just something that gets through to your belly like nothing else I've experienced. The volume goes up, there's the tragedy of the lyrics. It is the most extraordinary moment uh, when you guys play it. How is it for you? as musicians tell me as just a an audience member how you create that drama it's kind of chemical the song just builds on on a drone really and it just becomes more and more and more intense it's a little bit like coming up on some amazing drug because it sort of gets into you and it slowly builds and you feel higher and more intense and more intense and it gets louder and the sound world gets fuller and it really is it's quite a euphoric moment really as you sort of reach the heights on that song i've always loved playing that song I hear fifteen monkeys who carnivalize My head is full of spines Well, thank you, Dids, and we look forward to hearing the new album live in London in September. And um, I'd like to close out with with one of your solo pieces, if I can. Uh, Tell us about it. I've got a track from my last album, which was originally a very tiny idea I submitted for 20 years that didn't get taken up. No creative work is ever a waste of time. I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't get really. And even if you don't return to something, the 
time you spent on that process is time well invested. I'm just going to disclose a tiny secret here that nobody knows. Actually, David appears on this song. <laughs> David's burp from LLPU has been time stretched and um, bit crushed to within an in inch of its life and creates a sort of texture that opens the song. The track is called Autonomist and it's from my Gagarin album called Corvid.